Lionel Shriver is one of the best-known novelists in the English language. Her book, We Need to Talk About Kevin, about a mass murderer, won the Orange Prize, one of the most prestigious. But the last time Shriver was in Australia, she hit the headlines not for her books, but because of the Brisbane Writers' Festival, she called out identity politics. She put on a Mexican sombrero and demanded to know why a writer couldn't write from the point of view of anyone at all, from a women's point of view, if she was, uh, was a man, or from a Mexican's, if she was Anglo, and so on. Well, the warriors of identity politics went nuts. Sudanese Australian activist Yasmin Abdel Magid wrote a poisonous piece in the Guardian Australian newspaper saying that she had to walk out on Travis lecture because it became about the fact that a white man should be able to write about the experience of a young Nigerian woman. And it became, Abdel Magid fumed, a celebration of the unfettered exploitation of the experiences of others under the guise of fiction. And that's apparently bad, I didn't know, because the Brisbane Writers' Festival criticised Shriver for speaking outside her brief. But Shriver is back in Australia to give the John Benithan Lecture tomorrow for the Centre for Independent Studies. I spoke to Lionel Shriver a short while ago. Lionel Shriver, thank you so much indeed for your time. You said, kind of, that you wouldn't come back to Australia after the walkout and the criticism of your speech last time you are here. I'm absolutely glad you're back. What changed your mind? Well, um... That may have been a fit of petulance on my part. After all, um, there's no reason to uh, take it out on the entirety of Australia uh, just because I wasn't treated very well by a few administrators in a, s a small literary festival. Uh, I, this is my sixth trip to Australia, uh, and, uh, and I'm glad I came back, honestly. Well, maybe your best yet. You've said that uh, identity politics is uh, fascistic. What did you mean by that? Well, it's a movement that is uh, bent on imposing uh, a whole language, uh, a way of thinking uh, on everyone else. And I, it's also a movement which is uh, very involved in uh, keeping us all in our own little boxes. So. Uh, all of our interests have to do with which little box we're in and we can't have an, opi an opinion about any of the other boxes. And this, this is a very rigid uh, social structure. Uh, it, it keeps people pitted against each other because, you know, the boxes are all in competition with each other. And I just, I think it's an ugly way to think about the world and to behave toward other people. And I think the boxes are pretty rigidly defined and Very. arbitrarily too, gender, race, whatever. Uh, look, to, to give an illustration of, of the kind of thing we're talking about here, I, I've re, uh, recently reread Bleak House, which I think is a masterpiece. Now, there is Charles Dickens writing half of it from the point of view of a young woman. I also just uh, read the other day The Tenant of Wildfell Hall, in which Anne Bronte writes half of it from the point of view of a young man. What is it about a technique that was acceptable and valuable back then that is now unacceptable today? It's, it is entirely acceptable. Uh, one of the things I think we always have to remember is it's just like uh, Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz who suddenly realizes she's wearing the shoes. We have the power. You know, people are constantly coming up with uh, rules we're supposed to obey, but these people have no authority. And we don't have to obey those rules. Uh, the, uh, this new taboo against uh, cultural appropriation, well, who came up with that? I don't even care who came up with that. I don't have to obey it. And uh, one of the things that I try to encourage my fellow fiction writers to remember is that we were attracted to this profession in the first place because it allows us to construct our own worlds and also to make our own rules. And that's what's really fun about the profession. It's also what's fun about reading, is enter, entering in imaginatively to these, to these uh, universes which have been created for us to walk around in, like, a, you know, effectively like a video game. And uh, 
we, it's not in the interests of the readership or of the writer to construct a lot of constraining rules of things that you can and cannot do. Fundamentally, uh, writing is, is always a, a, about theft, about borrowing, about taking little bits and pieces from the world and constructing your own montage. And uh, it's, it's not an intent uh, evil or kleptomaniacal. It, it is in the interest of uh, creating uh, more insight, more awareness of others. And you know, if, if, a, if a male writer can successfully project himself into the uh, mind of a female character, I think that's brilliant. Uh, I write from a male point of view all the time. I use characters from different races and ethnicities. Uh, I've written about a disabled character before. And all of, all of these exercises, uh, especially when they've been successful, have uh, been to my, my own personal benefit and certainly to my artistic benefit. Look, you're absolutely correct in saying you know, the power lies with us to defy them, and particularly to a reader. A reader can pick up whatever book they uh, damn well like and, and enjoy it by uh, their own standards. They don't need to be uh, monstered by anyone else, take, take the lectures uh, on board. But the point is, of course, that the publishers can, and the booksellers, can act as gatekeepers. Now, last year, I'll give you an, ex an example that you know very well, that you were sacked as the judge of a writing competition when you mocked Penguin Random House, the publisher, for announcing that it would track the diversity of its writers to make sure that it published enough from minority groups. Now, first of all, why did you object? Penguin Random House uh, sent an email and questionnaire around to all its authors' agents um, requesting both the uh, diversity details of their authors, but also advertising a new policy that they plan to, uh, by 2025, uh, get the, both their staff and their authors list to perfectly reflect the statistical makeup of the UK population in relation to race, ethnicity, disability, class, gender, and sexual preference, and I've probably left something out. Um, and I, I mean, that's a hell of a, an algorithm, isn't it? Uh, and oh, and they also announced that they were no longer going to have any educational requirements for their employees. So you don't, you don't have to have been to school at all. Well, you know, yeah, I made merciless fun of, of this policy. I mean, I think it's a very good example of uh, a company losing its way in terms of what it's for. The purpose of a publishing company is to produce books that people want to buy and read. And you make decisions in accordance with which books have the best chance of succeeding commercially, or if not commercially, at least artistically. It is not to reflect the perfect proportions of various minorities in its staff and its author's list. It might, ha might be improving of the breadth of a, a, of a catalog to include more authors with a different kinds of experience and perhaps with different ethnic or racial backgrounds or religious backgrounds. You know, it's, I'm not anti-diversity, but I am anti-quota. And therefore, when you put quotas first, then you start making decisions on the basis of who wrote it and not what they wrote. But uh, in that story, I wonder what should worry us most, because it seems to me that you've uh, come into conflict with two trends here, not one, um, and to, both of them unfortunate. What's most worrying, that Penguin Random House tracks the diversity of writers in a sort of quota system, or that you get dumped from a literary ju jury for saying that you don't agree. It's the deplatforming here, too, that surely is uh, deeply concerning. Well, I should clarify that I had only agreed to judge this short story contest, which was conducted by a rather obscure magazine, as a big favor to the editor. And uh, when they sacked me, um, they were doing me a favor <laughs> in return because it was just going to be a pain in the bum. Uh, so I was perfectly happy to be let go. 
I, I share your concern, however, that in, uh, there are other circumstances in which that kind of, you know, deplatforming or worse yet, uh, cancel culture uh, could have much more dire consequences. And I am certainly the, the kind of uh, public figure who is likely to be in the crosshairs for that kind of treatment. I'm very concerned broadly about the whole idea of cancel culture and of, uh, if not outright murdering people literally, at least murdering them in a, in a professional sense uh, so that they can no longer make a living. And one of the worst things that's happening to artists of every description is that uh, w when, they, when they get canceled, um, not only can they not work anymore, but uh, their previous accomplishments are withdrawn from the artistic uh, marketplace. And uh, actually I did an essay about this called uh, uh, oh, something in creative, it's, never mind. <laughs> I'll look it up. Um, stick it look it up. Phone. But uh, it's... It's, it seems it's a cruel and cruel and unusual punishment was the title, and to me that seems like ext e extraordinary punishment, especially for someone who has put together a whole body of work. I mean, look at Woody Allen, uh, all those films, some of which are actually pretty damn good, uh, and yet uh, people are now very reluctant to screen his films because of something he is rumored to have done, but has never been proved to have done. Lionel Shriver, thank you so much for standing against the, uh, this culture of uh, silencing. Uh, I really appreciate it, and good luck in this visit to Australia. Thank you very much.